So let's compare them, and we'll start with the Trinity. Why do Christians believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? We believe it because we are forced into this view by the triune God, not because of uh, church councils. The church councils were forced into that view by the triune God. Um, for Christians, we have a certain amount of data that we work with. Everyone has some data, right? We look around, we see the world, we see that it's organized in certain ways, we know that there's a moral law. There are hundreds of millions of people in the world today who believe that they have witnessed miracles. All of this uh, helps us formulate a concept of God. Uh, but Christians also have the scriptures, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when we start reading uh, the scriptures, things get very interesting very quickly. Um, so, these are the first two verses of the Bible, long before Christians came along. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we've got God, but then there's a distinction that says, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Later in the same chapter, opening chapter of the Bible, verse 26, we read, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Now, two obvious questions. One, who was he talking to? And two, why does he say, let us, plural, make man, plural, I mean, make man in our, plural, image? The plural of majesty, right? Well, the Jews didn't use the plural of majesty. So why is he using this? It's just a mystery so far. Um, we don't know yet, but as we continue reading, the mystery gets deeper. In Isaiah 9, 6, the prophet delivers a prophecy. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. A child is born, a son is given, and this child is said to be the Mighty God. How is a child going to be the Mighty God? In Isaiah chapter 48, verse 16, Yahweh is speaking. Yahweh is the speaker. And he says, Draw near to me, hear this. From the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Yahweh is speaking, and Yahweh says that he has been sent by Yahweh along with the spirit of Yahweh. How can God be sent by God along with the spirit of God? Well, we just don't know. Still later in the Old Testament, Zechariah 12.10, Yahweh is again speaking, and he says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Yahweh will pour out a spirit which causes people to repent, and they will look on Yahweh, whom they have pierced, and mourn for him as one grieves for a lost son. How can an immaterial God be pierced unless he takes on a body? So the Old Testament concludes and leaves us with a lot of questions about how to reconcile the claim that there is only one God with some intriguing hints at plurality. Then Jesus comes along. Jesus tells his followers that he's the final judge of all people, even though the Old Testament says that Yahweh is the final judge of all people. Jesus says that he's the one who raises the dead at the resurrection, even though the Old Testament says that Yahweh is the one who raises the dead at the resurrection. Jesus calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. He claims to be the Lord of the prophet David. He claims to be the I Am of the Exodus. He claims to be greater than God's temple. Jesus tells us that he has an absolutely unique relationship with the Father, that he can answer prayers, that he's present wherever his followers are gathered, that he is with his followers forever, and that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. He even makes the startling declaration that 
All things that the Father has are mine. But Jesus also prays to the Father, and he claims to be from the Father. Why would Jesus make claims that only God can make, yet also be drawing attention to God as the Father? In John 14 through 16, Jesus says that after he returns to the Father, he and the Father will together send the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is sent, and yet, as we've seen, the Spirit was with the Father at creation. Psalm 104 verse 30 says that the Spirit creates the universe. The Spirit is omniscient in 1 Corinthians, omnipresent in Psalm 139, and eternal in Hebrews 9. These are divine attributes, and yet the Spirit is distinct from the Father and the Son. So what do we do all of, with all of this? Well, if the Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Spirit is God, and the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father, and there's only one God, the Trinity is the only way out. And that's why I said that we were forced into this view by the triune God himself. 